Hiromini and Rack by G. Bramwell Evans Give me the clear blue sky over my head and the green turf beneath my feet, a winding road before me, and then to thinking. Chapter 1 The Lure of the Open Air August I do not remember a time when the countryside had no fascination for me. Give me a lane and a hedge, and heaven lies in exploring its shadows and becoming intimate with its shy inhabitants. Probably this is due to the fact that I spring from pure gypsy stock. In my veins run the blood of nomads who have sought the solitudes for hundreds of centuries. It is this ancestry which has made me a Roma, and like a bird hearing its migratory call, so the fields and the woods lure me from the city life. I know what it is to climb the stiff cliffs of lonely Elsa Craig, to listen to the chant of the gannet as I photograph them on the narrow ledges which overlook the sea 400 feet below. I can hear again the cry of the kittiwakes and oyster catchers as I near their nests on other lonely islands of the Scottish coasts. Yet of all the places I have visited, there is none which yield me so much content as rambling round the countryside. Could you take a peep at my caravan at where it now rests? You would see it shadowed by boughs on which the apples lie thickly and heavily. By the side of it runs a hedge where the bees lumber cumbrously on the bramble blossom, and where the linty sings a plaintive litany as she sways on some slender bough. Just behind the tent runs the stream. I can hear its tiny tinkle even as I write. A very subdued yet high melody is its singing, the melody of a thin string, of shallow waters, of attenuated channels. All its dryads and nymphs are for the moment tremulous sopranos. But the hoped for rain will come ere long and the tone will change. The ringing of its bells will give place to a roar and hiss of triumph. Then from their lairs will issue forth the big trout. Up from the neighbouring river the sea trout will seek its yellow waters, thirsting for the flavour of the beck, which perchance thirst gave them birth. My caravan has a history. It has rumbled along the roads and lanes and heard the chatter of the Romanies as the light on the campfires lit up their swarthy faces. I am reminded of them by the big box attached to the rear. This big receptacle was most useful when passing turnip or potato fields. Not to put many in at once, that was not necessary, for there were plenty of other fields to be passed, and the box would still be there. The hook on the axle is where Boz the lurcher is tethered, and under which, when any strangers were about, he used to lie as meek as a lamb. In their presence he cultivated a slight limp and had the knack of looking prematurely old. But as soon as their backs were turned, a rejuvenated phoenix would have looked antiquated beside him, especially as he sleuthed it up in the hedgeside. The hook is still behind the van, but the lurcher that never barked and never knew when he was beaten is now in other happy hunting grounds. R.I.P. As I lounge by the caravan steps, a flash of green and scarlet streaks through the trees, dodging the trunks with marvellous precision. Then from the end of the orchard there comes a joyous yaffle. It holds in its tones satisfaction and derision. I listen for a moment and then hear a definite strong tapping of the wood. It is the green woodpecker at work. He owns the orchard too. When, in the thousands of years that have rolled by, his ancestors determined to seek their living on the bark of trees with occasional relapses in the direction of anthills and marshy ground, nature fashioned their bodies to suit their habitats. The All Mother has been very generous to him and his kind. She has made him a specialist in the art of probing. His bill is a strong drill. From where I sit I can see him driving it at the tree trunk. I cannot see the individual drives so fast as he withdraw and strike, withdraw and strike. All I can see is a blur of green and cardinal. Then I can hear the reverberating thuds. Could I crawl nearer, I should see that his tail is very different from that of the sparrow chirping from the caravan roof. 
Indeed, he uses it almost as a stool, and pressing it firmly against the bark, sits on it. With his two feet, such an arrangement makes an excellent tripod stand. Steadied thus, he searches with his long telescopic tongue for the hiders in the bark. I would like you to see that tongue, for on the end of it is a barb such as you find on an angler's hook. Feel it, and you will notice that nature has dipped it in secotine. It is a harpoon for the struggling larvae, and the stickiness picks up the smallest of fry. Look, he is... But the bird has caught my slightest movement, and with a derisive chuckle is lost in the neighbouring trees. When night draws down the curtain on the orchard in which the caravan rests, then the fire is lit. With Rack, my constant companion, a spaniel with an animal's sensitiveness and a human being's understanding, I sit and watch the pine logs flicker. The incense rises, and as the smoke curls upwards into indigo night, I see the faces of those who love the countryside as I do, and interpret its phases to me. Away up in the fields I hear the call of the ewes to their lambs, and my mind flies at once to the farm where Alan and Joe live. What hospitality Joe's wife and the sisters offer to me! How great is their never-varying welcome! Then the silence is broken by the bark of a fox, and in spirit I am with John Fell, the gamekeeper. That bark, I know, will make him uneasy about the safety of his young pheasants, and I can see him walking round his sanctuary, in the hope of heading off the sleuth of the woods. Soon from the stream behind me I hear the plunge of a sea trout, and I wonder whether my friend John Rubb is bringing any to their doom by his skilful casting of the fly. I think also of Jerry the poacher, but not a ne'er-do-well. I marvel at the queer nature of the man which endears him to all who know him. Even the keeper is one of his friends. As I think of him, I envy, too, the rich store of knowledge which he has of every bird and beast. I envy him, too, his lovely thatched cottage which nestles on the fringe of a wood. Musing thus, I feel how blessed I am in my friends. Who would not delight to go with Ned, the village postman, as he delivers his letters to distant farms, and to listen to him as he unfolds the marvels of insect, flower or pond life? Then there is Sally Stordy, whose cottage is a refuge and a rest, and whose quaint outlook on life and her sound common sense is a joy to listen to. I love the smithy too. To begin with, it has a smell all its own. The buyer has its own fragrance, so has the barn. No one can mistake the flowery, dry mustiness of the granary, but the smithy is a mixture of burning horn and scorched leather. Of course the blacksmith has his work to do, and does it well. But what the shop and post office are to the women of the village, the smithy is to the menfolk. It is the unofficial BBC of the district. There is, too, an air of timelessness about its smoke crime walls, and here and there are unconventional seats worn smooth and bright by the corduroys of its habitués. Talk flares up at intervals, even as the bellows call on the slumbering fire to wake up and glow red, and the smith, even though he's beating out a merry tattoo on the anvil, still manages to catch the spicy titbits of gossip as newcomers drop in and range themselves among the shadows. At the village shop, smoke seen issuing from an unused chimney is sufficient to keep the ball of gossip rolling for a whole morning. Who knows but what it may portend the arrival of a visitor? Or perchance that fire burning through the night may mean that a new bairn has arrived. The absence of the usual smoke from Sally Stordy's washhouse will call forth a torrent of questions as to the reason for this departure from the usual. But in the smithy runs the rumour of a new kind of threshing machine which Dick Pennington is getting, or men speak in admiration of the price which Jim Shepherd received for his lambs. As the darkness deepens in the orchard, then the bats swing round and round in even undulating circles. Above the top of the grass, the white moths are doing the ghost dance. The owl leaves the warm barn, and after sitting motionless on some bare branch, sweeps down with deadly precision towards the darkening grass. The stars are out, and the last pale shimmer of light shows from the top of the hills. I go towards the tent and throw myself on the bed. I can see the pole star and the great bear blinking at me through the open flap. 
The hayrick sends me its final benediction. The world is drowsy. Only young cockerel mistakes the hour and begins to crow prematurely. Now too the brook is singing its sweetest lullaby. A distant train I can hear rushing to some town where poor folks are sleeping in stuffy rooms while I am bathed in the wonders of a velvet world. Ah oh well, I must turn in.